Hi, this is Ben Goodrich, and today, due to the snow cancellation, we're going to have to have uh, the regular lecture by screen share. So this is uh, an extension of what we started to do last week when we were doing discrete probability distributions and so forth. This week, we're going to pivot to continuous probability distributions and examine the implications of those. Again, these are important because ultimately for Bayesian statistics, you have to express your beliefs about parameters, beliefs about how data were generated by parameters in the language of probability distributions. And in most cases, the parameters of interest are not going to be discrete. And so we need to be able to use continuous probability distributions. But first, just to review and extend a little bit on distributions, probability distributions for discrete random variables. Remember that we talked last week about the probability that a random variable x is equal to some element of its sample space, little x. If that function is depends on some parameters, which in general will be unknown, but you can treat them as known for the purpose of notation. We call this a probability mass function or a PMF and denote it by little f of x given theta, where theta is sort of a generic symbol for whatever the parameters of that distribution might be. So lambda in the case of a Poisson distribution, P in the case of a binomial distribution. Um, so we use the binomial distribution for uh, thinking about bowling. And so if you can calculate the probability that you knock down X equal four pins on your first roll of a frame of bowling, you can easily calculate the probability of knocking down some number of pins less than or equal to four just by using the fact that those events are disjoint and if disjoint events we can simply add the probabilities of those things occurring without having to make any correction for the probability that they both occur because you can't knock down two pins and four pins simultaneously on the same roll. So that function, the probability that a random variable x is less than or equal to some value usually from the sample space, uh, little x is the sum of the probability mass function from whatever is the smallest value of the sample space up to and including x. So that was actually a typo on the slides. That should be the sum of f of x evaluated at y sub i given theta. The sum of that up to the value little x is a function known as the cumulative mass function that is denoted by big F of x given theta. So these little f and big F are related to each other by the fact that big F is the sum of a bunch of little f. And the sum is denoted, uh, like I said, with a big F and is called the cumulative mass function. One of the implications of the cumulative mass function is that if we want to calculate the probability that a random variable x is greater than some value a, and simultaneously less than or equal to some value x, where a and x are both elements of the sample space for this random variable x, that can be worked out as the difference between f evaluated, big F evaluated at x, minus the big F function evaluated at a. And furthermore, in the special case where x is equal to a plus one, that difference in the cumulative mass functions in the numerator and then divide by x minus a in the denominator. But since x is equal to a plus one, that just simplifies to one in the denominator. And the difference between f of x evaluated at a plus one and f for x evaluated at a is just the probability that x is exactly equal to little x, which we defined before to be the little f function evaluated at x given theta. 
Thus, this construction shows us that little f, the probability mass function, is the slope of a line segment connecting the point A to the cumulative mass function evaluated at A to the point A plus 1 and the cumulative mass function evaluated at A plus 1. And since the slope of the line segment uh, can also be conceptualized as the rate of change. So little f, the probability mass function, can also be conceptualized as the rate of change in the cumulative mass function evaluated at x. And this serves as a bridge to how we think about uh, probability distributions in the case of a continuous sample space. But just to reinforce this a little bit more, here we have a picture of a Poisson cumulative mass function with lambda equal to 2. So the mean and the variance of this distribution are both equal to 2. And it's not surprising that a lot of the cumulative mass is concentrated in very small numbers. So again, this is the cumulative mass function, the probability that the random variable that you're modeling is less than or equal to a given value along the horizontal axis. So the probability that the count is less than or equal to four is the height of this bar here in the middle, um, which goes up uh, well over 0.9, it looks like. Now, if we look at these, oops, um, in light of what we've said on the previous slide, these are all evaluations of the cumulative mass function. And so the difference between consecutive bars, let's say the difference between the cumulative mass function evaluated at two and the cumulative mass function evaluated at one is uh, the difference between the green dot and the red dot. And so that is the probability that the count is exactly equal to two which is the only thing consistent with being less than or equal to two, but not less than or equal to one. And so in this case, uh, the slopes of these dotted lines are equal to the probability mass function, the probability that the count is exactly equal to X. So in this case, the green line segment is the probability or the slope of the green line segment is the probability that x is exactly equal to 2. And you can see that these slopes change depending on what value of x we're talking about. So it has a faster slope uh, on these red and green dotted lines and then a more flat slope on the dark blue and the light blue and the purple and the yellow uh, lines. So you can see as uh, x gets larger, the amount of mass tacked on to the cumulative mass function gets smaller and smaller. Another way of saying that is that the probability mass function gets smaller and smaller. So the probability that the count is exactly equal to x is small and gets smaller for larger values of x up to the point where if you evaluate it at infinity or indeed any uh, moderately large number, the cumulative mass function is going to be arbitrarily close to one. But the point I want to emphasize in this plot are these line segments and how the slope of these line segments uh, connecting consecutive bars of the cumulative mass function, those slopes are equal to the probability mass function, little f, evaluated at uh, whatever value of x you are interested in. So moving on again, now we're going to think about uh, what are known as probability and cumulative density functions. And those are referred to as density functions rather than mass functions, because now we're thinking of the sample space as being an interval. For example, an interval could be an entire real line just the non-negative elements of the real number line, or it could be some bounded interval. So uh, omega is all the points between P and Q, where P might be zero, Q might be one, could be any numbers. There's a variety of, of sample spaces for continuous random variables. But because every interval, no matter how small, 
has an infinite number of points in it, we think of the probability that a random variable x is exactly equal, exactly, exactly, exactly equal to some particular point in the sample space as being zero for all elements of x from that sample space. And that uh, is a little bit like what we saw in the case of a Poisson random variable, although that was a discrete random variable, there was no upper bound on it. So the sample space had a countably infinite number of points in it and the probability of a random variable taking a sufficiently big number has to go uh, towards zero in order for it to be an admissible probability distribution. In the case of a genuinely continuous sample space, uh, basically we have to define the probability of a random variable being exactly equal to one of the infinite number of points in that interval as uh, zero for all elements of X. And that would seem to throw a wrench uh, into a lot of our calculations, but that wrench is sort of resolved by using a little bit of, of calculus. So even though we can't meaningfully refer to the probability of a random variable X being equal uh, to some point, we can continue to validly conceptualize the probability of a continuous random variable big X being less than or equal uh, to a little x from the sample space. Uh, and that is again, denote that function if it depends on some parameters theta is again denoted by capital F, a function evaluated at x given theta and the probability that a random variable x is less than or equal to a particular value is going to be greater than or equal to zero. And that's a perfectly valid uh, function to think about and it has a special name. It's called the cumulative density function. Now there's not really a conceptual difference between a cumulative mass function like we were talking about before and a cumulative density function which we're talking about now except to emphasize whether the sample space is discrete or continuous. If it's discrete we call it a cumulative mass function. If it's continuous we call it a cumulative density function but even that is only uh, when we're being extremely precise a lot of times you will see uh, the function denoted by big F is referred to a CDF whether or not the sample space is discrete or continuous but we'll uh, maintain the distinction even though it's just for our emphasis in both cases the cumulative mass function and the cumulative density function tell you the probability that a random variable is less than or equal to some value from the sample space. They just differ depending on whether that random variable is discrete or continuous. So again, it is the case that the even if X is continuous, the probability that a continuous random variable big X is greater than A, but simultaneously less than or equal uh, to little X, where both A and X are from the uh, sample space omega, again, is just the difference in the cumulative density function evaluated at x and evaluated at a. So that's the same as in the discrete case. It is also true and similar to the discrete case that if we define x as a plus h, then the difference in the cumulative density functions in the numerator divided by x minus a in the uh, denominator tells us, you know, the rise over the run. So it's a slope um, and it's the slope of the line segment connecting the point A on the horizontal axis to the cumulative density function on the vertical axis evaluated at A to the point A plus H on the horizontal axis. And uh, that should be A plus one on the uh, or a plus H, uh, the cumulative density function evaluated at A plus H on the vertical axis. So the slope of the line segment connecting uh, those two points is equal to the difference in the cumulative density function divided by the difference between X minus A, which if X is equal to A plus H, just simplifies to H. If we then let H approach zero from above, then that uh, corresponds to the definition of a derivative, which you might remember 
uh, from calculus. So the partial derivative of the CDF as A uh, get, makes a slightly uh, a marginal increase in A. And we are going to define that at that derivative of the cumulative density function with respect to X, again, using the notation of a function little f of x given parameters theta that is still the rate of change in uh, the cdf evaluated at x and that function little f is known as a probability density function or a pdf even though i forgot to write that definition onto the slide so if uh, we think about little f as still being the rate of change in big F evaluated at X. And so that is similar to how we thought of the probability mass function relating to the cumulative mass function in the discrete case. It's just now we're thinking of X as being a continuous random variable. So this is the instantaneous rate of change in the cumulative uh, density function, that being the uh, probability density function. So we can see that in terms of a graph that is uh, somewhat analogous to the picture that uh, we saw before for a Poisson cumulative mass function, except now we have a continuous probability distribution whose sample space uh, for X is the numbers between zero and one. And this probability, or this probability distribution, which here is being represented in CDF form is called the Kumara Shwami uh, distribution. And so this uh, curve that you see in the plot here is the cumulative density function for the Kumara Shwami distribution. It has two parameters, alpha and beta, both of which are constrained to be positive. This particular curve results from putting in two for alpha and three for beta. If you took uh, different values for alpha and beta, the shape of the curve would differ, but it would still be a uh, strictly increasing function from the smallest value in the sample space, which is zero, to the largest value in the sample space, which is one. And this uh, curve in general is represented by the equation one minus the quantity one minus x raised to the power alpha all raised to the power beta. And as you can see, for small values of x, the slope of this line is uh, pretty small. Then the slope gets bigger uh, as you uh, put in more intermediate values of x. And as x gets close to one, again, the slope of the, of the CDF gets flatter. And so that illustrates the fact that the slope of the cumulative density function depends on x in addition to alpha and beta. But again, in this case, alpha is two and beta is three. And so the only thing that is uh, uh, driving the change in the slope is what value of x you put in. So the slope of, uh, of the CDF line at any particular point is a function of x. And we actually know how to derive uh, that particular function. We just need to take the derivative of the cumulative density function, uh, the partial derivative with respect to x. And we're not going to emphasize uh, those rules of calculus too much in this class, but it's merely using the uh, derivative rule for exponents and the chain rule a couple times to arrive at this function, which is the PDF for the Kumara Shwami distribution, little f of x, again, we're gonna evaluate this at alpha is two and beta is three, is uh, equal to alpha times beta times x raised to the power of alpha minus one times the quantity one minus x to the alpha raised to the power beta minus one. And so this is the uh, derivative of the function that we saw on the, the previous slide. All of these numbers are going to be positive if x is constrained between uh, 0 and 1. 
but you can see that for intermediate values of x, the, the value of the uh, probability density function, the PDF, exceeds 1 uh, between about x is 0.2 and x is about 0.8 or so. So that uh, illustrates one of the differences between a probability density function and a probability mass function in the discrete case is the probability density function because it's a slope of the CDF rather than a probability itself. It is not restricted to be between 0 and 1. Uh, the probability density function can go above 1, at least for a limited amount of the sample space. It's only restricted to be positive, and all the uh, area underneath the curve has to uh, total up to, to 1. So really, you can just think about the probability density function as the slope of the cumulative density function evaluated at a particular point x and using uh, whatever values of the parameters you want. If you change the parameters, then the shape of these curves would change a little bit, but the essence of them would remain the same. So how might we construct a continuous probability distribution? There's two basic ways of doing that. The first is to start with the cumulative density function which is to take any strictly increasing function from the sample space to the interval 0, 1. We'll call that big F of x uh, given theta. And then we'll just take the partial derivative of that CDF function with respect to F, big F, and uh, take the partial derivative of big F with respect to x and define that as the probability density function, little f, of x given theta. The other way to construct a continuous probability distribution is to start with what's known as the kernel of the probability density function. So that method, you would take any kernel function, which we'll denote with k, the function k of x given theta. That function uh, needs to be any function from the sample space to the non-negative real numbers such that the integral of the kernel function over the entire sample space is a finite number. And since the kernel function is restricted to be non-negative, it will be a positive number. But the important thing about it is for that uh, integral to be finite over the entire sample space. Then we can set the probability density function, little f, define that as 1 over the function c of theta, which is the area under the kernel uh, function for that sample space. If we divide uh, the kernel function by however much area is underneath that curve, then that implies that our little f of x function, the PDF, is going to integrate to 1 over the entire sample space and that makes it a valid uh, PDF. So if we take a function, the kernel function k, and divide by however much area is underneath it, the area underneath the resulting little f function is going to be 1. Then we can make the cumulative density function, big F of x evaluated at theta, as the definite integral from whatever is the smallest element of the sample space up to little x, uh, the number that we're interested in evaluating, uh, that integral of little f um, over uh, that subinterval of the sample space is the function uh, for the cumulative density function. So we can go either way. The first method, starting with the CDF and just doing the derivative, is simpler. Um, and, but they're not, uh, there are not an infinite, well, there probably are an infinite number, but there are not an infinite number of commonly used functions uh, from a sample space to the interval uh, 0, 1. So you don't see the first method being used uh, too much, but all of the, the CDFs uh, that um, are closed form increasing functions from some sample space to the zero one interval uh, 
um, have uh, certainly been well utilized in statistics over the past hundred years or so. The second method of starting with the kernel of the PDF is actually more common, uh, but it has the difficulty that it often doesn't yield uh, closed form integrals. Uh, so sometimes uh, the C of theta function uh, is just uh, some integral that we can't really uh, simplify or write in closed form. But nevertheless, if we can prove that C of theta, the area under the kernel function is finite, uh, then we can use the, the second method, even if it's not so mathematically convenient. So what are the differences between a density uh, and a mass function? So the differences are that the probability mass function in the discrete case actually yields a probability in addition to being the slope of a line segment of the cumulative mass function. The PDF does not, in the continuous case, does not yield a probability. It is only the slope of the cumulative density function evaluated at x. Consequently, a probability mass function is restricted to be between 0 and 1 inclusive, while a probability density function uh, has to be non-negative, but does not have any upper bound. So the slope of a CDF can exceed one on some subinterval of the sample space. In the discrete case, the cumulative mass function is just the sum, again, that should be little f evaluated at yi for all values of yi that are less than or equal to little x. And in the continuous case of uh, continuous random variable x, it's the integral from whatever is the smallest element of the sample space to uh, up to the value of x that you're interested in, the integral of that PDF. So those are the differences between a probability mass function and a probability density function and how they relate to the corresponding cumulative function. The similarities are basically uh, everything else. So in both the discrete case and the continuous case, we can construct a uh, bivariate function, little f, as the product of a marginal probability distribution for x multiplied by a conditional distribution for y given x. We could also do it the other way around with a marginal probability distribution for y times the conditional probability distribution of x given y. So the uh, general multiplication rule holds in both the discrete and the continuous case. We also have a Bayes rule uh, taking the same general form regardless of whether uh, the unknowns we're talking about are continuous or discrete. We can write that as a probability distribution for the unknown parameters theta given whatever data we might condition on as uh, just rearranging the general multiplication rule to get a marginal distribution for our beliefs about theta multiplied by a conditional distribution for how we think the data are generated given theta and dividing by a marginal uh, probability distribution for the data. If we have those three things on the right side, we can construct an expression for the probability distribution of the unknown theta given the known data. And that is true regardless of whether we're talking about a discrete or continuous theta. Also, the other properties of uh, probability functions that we talked about on the first day of class continue to hold regardless of whether we're talking about a discrete or continuous random variable. For example, the probability that a random variable x is greater than some value little x from the sample space is just the complement of the uh, cumulative function, whether that uh, function big F is a cumulative mass function in the discrete case or a cumulative density function in the continuous case. So I will use big F interchangeably for whether it is a cumulative mass function or a cumulative density function. And I'll use little f interchangeably for a probability mass function in the discrete case and a probability density function in the continuous case, but I will only use big F and little f for these particular functions. If I'm talking about an arbitrary function, uh, 
I'll use G or H or something like that. So big F pertains to a cumulative function, little f uh, pertains to a probability mass function or a probability density function. I won't use any other uh, letters for a CMF, CDF, PDF, PMF. Um, and if I'm using a, talking about an arbitrary function, I'll use some other letter uh, besides F uh, for that notation. So um, another thing that is similar between uh, discrete random variables and continuous random variables is how we calculate expectations of a function of that variable. Although uh, there is one uh, hopefully rather obvious difference. So if g of x is a function of a continuous random variable x, then we define the expectation of that function as the integral of the product between uh, the g function and the pdf, little f, integrated uh, over all the values of x in the sample space presuming that integral converges. And so in the case of a continuous random variable, we have to be a little bit more careful about that because if the sample space of X uh, goes on to infinity on one side or, or both sides, it's a possibility that the integral does not converge, in which case we say that the expectation of G of X does not exist. And that actually happens um, for uh, some distributions. But if it exists, uh, then the expectation of the function g of x is essentially just the area under the curve g times f uh, for the uh, entire sample space omega. So compared to the discrete case of calculating the expectation of some function of a discrete random variable, we're just changing the summation in the discrete case to an integral in the uh, continuous case. In both, it is essentially a, uh, a weighted uh, summation of the G function using the F function as weights. In the discrete case, we're summing over points that we evaluate uh, the G function at. In the continuous case, we're summing over uh, bits of area uh, since we have a continuous random variable x. But integration is basically the uh, continuous analog of summation. It's just adding area rather than adding points. So in terms of uh, calculating the expectations of a continuous random variable for the common g functions, uh, so the G, uh, the identity function G of X equal X. If we, uh, calculate the expectation of that, that is known as the expectation or the mean, the G function X minus its mean quantity squared. If we evaluate the expectation of that function, it's the variance, etc. So all the same G functions that we use in the discrete case, we use those same G functions in the continuous case and we weight them uh, by little f. It just, in the uh, continuous case, that means we have to do integration uh, to figure out what those expectations are, whereas in the discrete case, uh, we only had to do summation. Similarly, if our g function involves two continuous random variables, x and y, the expectation of that g function is just going to be the double integral of the g function multiplied by the f function in this case, integrating over both x and y. So that would be sort of the area under a mountain defined by the product of the g function and the, the f function. Again, uh, if we use the, uh, the g functions that we talked about in the discrete case for uh, whose expectations have uh, special names, such as covariance and correlation, they're all going to be uh, the same G functions that we were talking about before. It's just now we are multiplying them by probability density functions instead of probability mass functions and doing integration rather than summation. So we're interested in the amount of area uh, under a curve. And so we can see that in the next plot 
where all of these uh, curves, they have different colors. Um, in all cases, uh, these curves are the product of some G function multiplied by some uh, PDF. In, in this case, the PDF is defined as E raised to the power negative X divided by the quantity one plus E raised to the ne negative X quantity squared. So that F uh, PDF is uh, being kept constant and the different uh, or the, the same across uh, each of the curves and the curves have different colors depending on what uh, G function they correspond to. So the black line is equal uh, to G of X times F of X, where uh, G of X is simply the constant one. And so the black line is uh, merely F of X over its whole, or essentially its whole sample space. It actually goes off to infinity in uh, both directions, but you can see uh, it's very uh, rare to get a value less than uh, negative five or greater than uh, positive five. In any event, we know that the area under the black curve is equal to one because it's just a valid probability density function. And so if the area under the black curve is equal to one, you can sort of judge with your eyes what is the area uh, under the other curves that have different colors uh, due to having different uh, G functions that are getting multiplied by the F function. So in the case of the red line, the G function is the identity function, G of X equal to X. And in this case, we see sometimes uh, the curve goes below zero on the vertical axis and sometimes the red curve is above zero on the vertical axis. And we can actually see that the red line is symmetric around zero. So when the curve uh, goes below zero on the vertical axis, that counts as negative area. And if we integrate uh, the red curve over the entire uh, real line, we have negative area canceling out uh, the positive area and the fact that the red curve is symmetric along the uh, horizontal axis at zero means that the negative area to the left of zero exactly cancels out with the uh, positive area to the right of zero and thus uh, the integral of g of x times f of x over the entire real line is going to be zero and when g of x is the identity function x, we call that uh, expectation of that function the expectation of x or the mean of x. And in this case, the expectation of the random variable x is zero because there's exactly as much negative area to the left of zero uh, with the red curve as there is area, positive area under the red curve uh, to the right of zero. If we take the G function X minus its mean, which in this case is zero quantity squared and uh, multiply that by the uh, little f function, we get the green line in this uh, picture, which is going to be strictly positive. And so when we integrate that, uh, we're going to get some positive number. Uh, it's not exactly obvious what that uh, positive number is in this particular case just by staring at the graph, uh, but we can see that it's going to be positive, which makes sense because the expectation of that G function is what we call the variance, and that has to be a positive number. If we go to the dark blue line, that's the function X minus its mean divided by its standard deviation, standard deviation being the square root of the variance. So uh, basically a standardized version of X cubed. And again, that is going to be a function that is symmetric around zero on the uh, horizontal axis in this case. And so the amount of negative area to the left of zero uh, for the dark blue curve exactly cancels out with the amount of positive area under the dark blue curve to the right of zero. Uh, 
So the expectation of that function, that G function is also going to be zero. And when the G function is defined that way, uh, it has a special name known as the skewness of the distribution. In this case, the skewness of this distribution is zero uh, or it's unskewed, symmetric, uh, all words for the same thing. Finally, the light blue uh, G function when multiplied uh, by little f yields the light blue curve here. That's the standardized version of x raised to the power of four and then subtracting three so that the expectation of this function is known as the excess kurtosis of uh, the distribution. So here we see for values of x that are sufficiently far away from zero, this uh, f of x times g of x is going to have a positive area. And for values of x sufficiently close to zero, uh, the product of the g and f is going to yield a negative number once we've uh, subtracted the three. And in this case, it looks like the amount of negative area close to zero exceeds the amount of positive area um, sort of less than negative two and, and greater than uh, positive two. So this is going to have, this distribution is going to have negative excess kurtosis, which is to say that it is less peaked than a normal distribution, which we're going to talk about next. But anyway, the point of this picture is the expectation of a function of a continuous random variable x is equivalent to asking the question, how much area is underneath the curve defined by the product of g of x and uh, the PDF f of x? So multiply those two things together. You can make a plot and at least get a rough sense of how much area is uh, under the curve, whether the, the integral uh, for the whole sample space is going to result in a positive number, negative number, etc. cetera. Um, but oftentimes it is not possible to analytically calculate what these integrals are. So while in calculus there are both general and uh, specific rules for differentiating a function, there are no general rules for anti-differentiation or uh, calculating a integral. There's only sort of a specific uh, or bag of tricks uh, for specific integrals that work in uh, particular cases, but there's no general algorithm uh, for uh, calculating an integral. There is an algorithm known as the uh, Risch algorithm that will determine for you, well, uh, it's only partially implemented in a variety of software, but in its most general form, it will determine for you if an indefinite integral of a function, if that uh, antiderivative is an elementary function. An elementary function is a function that just uses addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, uh, exponentiation, logarithms, square roots, uh, trigonometry, things like that. Uh, but many uh, integrals that we encounter in statistics are not elementary. Um, and so uh, the Risch algorithm is not uh, going to be so helpful for us. It will only tell us, it would only tell us that the function that we're interested in, in many cases, uh, doesn't have an elementary function as its indefinite integral, basically meaning there's no closed form way that we could simplify uh, that in order uh, to get a more manageable expression for it. But um, hope is not entirely lost because uh, definite integrals um, are a bit more manageable than indefinite integrals and uh, definite integrals uh, can be calculated in sort of an indirect way. So this expression that we have here uh, 1 over s times the summation of uh, the g function evaluated at random draws from a distribution whose PDF is a given little f function. So if we put uh, take random draws from the distribution defined by a particular PDF, put those into the g function and evaluate that, 
and we do that uh, for a diverging uh, total number of times, big S, the average of those evaluations of G at X values that are randomly generated according to a given PDF converges to the expectation of that G function as S gets large, where the G function or the expectation of that G function is formally defined as we did before as the integral over the entire sp sample space of the G function times the F function integrated over X. So this process of taking random draws from some distribution, evaluating the G function a bunch of times and taking the average of that is called Monte Carlo integration. And we can get a result that is arbitrarily close to the true expectation, which is characterized by this integral as long long as we make arbitrarily long. And this idea of Monte Carlo integration generalizes to multidimensional integrals, which we'll encounter a lot uh, starting in the next couple weeks and continuing for the entire uh, semester. And so the first day when we talked about, this is a class about modern Bayesian analysis, at that time it wasn't exactly clear what characterizes modern. But now uh, we can uh, go ahead and say what makes modern Bayesianism modern is it uses random number generation from uh, various distributions to evaluate uh, integrals that are sort of uh, formally defined uh, by Bayesianism as it was practiced uh, since the late 1700s up till uh, you know 1990 or so when it was sort of limited to the uh, situations in which they were able to evaluate these integrals defining expectations and so forth in closed form. Now we don't really do integrals ever uh, in a class like this. Maybe if someone else has already done them for us, uh, we'll look that up on Wikipedia or something like that. But in general, for us, integration means Monte Carlo integration. And we're going to do this uh, with uh, random draws. And provided we have a way of constructing those random draws, it's then pretty trivial to uh, estimate what some expectation is. We just need a lot of random draws, put those into the G function, and take the average. And that gives us something that is certainly close enough to the uh, expectation of G of X formally defined. And so we'll get into Monte Carlo uh, integration a lot more uh, over the, the rest of the semester. A couple of uh, distributions that are extremely prominent for continuous random variables are the uh, normal distribution, which ha is defined for a sample space over the entire real line. It has two parameters, a mean and a standard deviation, and thus the standard deviation is restric restricted to be positive. It has uh, this form of its PDF. Uh, so one uh, divided by sigma times the square root of two pi, where pi is the uh, number that's relevant to circles, uh, multiplied by E raised to the power uh, negative one half times the quantity X minus mu divided by sigma squared. And so this is an example of a uh, probability distribution that is constructed uh, with the uh, kernel, the second way uh, that we talked about before, it has a kernel function, which is uh, the part of the function that involves the random variable in question, the thing to the left of the vertical bar. So the only part of the normal PDF that involves X is uh, the function E raised to the power of negative one half times X minus mu divided by sigma quantity squared. That's the kernel of the uh, normal distribution. And we're not going to go through the proof, but it can be shown that over the whole uh, real line for sample space, the area of that kernel function is equal to sigma times the square root of 2 pi. So that becomes the uh, what's known as the normalizing constant. Uh, this is for a given sigma. If sigma were unknown, then it's not really a uh, constant, but at least it doesn't depend on the random variable in question x. And so if we take 
the amount of area underneath the uh, kernel function and divide by that, the resulting uh, PDF is going to have an area underneath it of one, making it a valid uh, probability density function. So the two parameters of the normal distribution are mu and sigma. If mu is equal to zero and sigma is equal to one, we get essentially the simplest form of the uh, normal PDF. And in that particular case, we call it the standard normal distribution. And so again, mu is the expectation of a normal distribution. Sigma is the standard deviation of a normal distribution. And the reason why we use mu and uh, sigma uh, for the expectation and sigma squared for the variance and sigma for the standard deviation uh, in general when we're uh, talking about lots of different types of distributions is because those are actually the parameters of a normal distribution and the normal distribution is so central for statistics, whether thinking about it from the uh, frequentist perspective or from the Bayesian perspective. The CDF of a normal distribution is one of these that can't be written in a closed form, but again, it's not a big uh, deal. Computers can evaluate uh, that integral numerically to um, as much precision as uh, a computer can manage. Uh, so that's certainly uh, precise enough for use in the social sciences. The logistic distribution is similar to the normal distribution in the sense that both are for a sample space that are uh, for the entire real line. They're both kind of bell-shaped uh, distributions. The main difference is the logistic distribution has a uh, CDF that is analytically tractable um, and we can use the first method for constructing a probability distribution just by differentiating the cumulative density function to obtain the probability density function. So the logistic distribution has a, a mean parameter mu and a scale parameter. In this case, I've written it in terms of xi. So uh, as xi, the uh, big F of x, the CDF, is just 1 over 1 plus e uh, raised to the power uh, negative of x minus mu all divided by xi. And if you take the derivative of that uh, CDF with respect to x, you get the PDF or little f of x function over here. Again, it's just an application of the chain rule a few times, e uh, to the power of uh, negative of that thing divided by uh, xi times the quantity one plus e raised to the negative power of that thing, quantity squared. So that is actually the uh, PDF that we were using on uh, this plot uh, in the case where mu is uh, zero and xi is one, which is uh, what's known as a standard logistic uh, distribution. But one of the ways in which the logistic distribution uh, differs from the normal distribution is that the variance of the logistic distribution is actually equal to xi squared times pi squared divided by three. If you saw the logistic distribution and the Siegel uh, and Moore reading, uh, they actually defined it a little bit uh, differently, but it's still the same standard logistic distribution. You'll encounter a lot of times uh, with these distributions there's different ways of parameterizing uh, them. Uh, different uh, Greek letters are used to, to represent the parameters and so forth. So you can see the logistic distribution and a lot of other distributions written down uh, in different ways, uh, but they're all essentially the, the same distribution. Um, so that can be something that is a little uh, confusing and can result in incompatibility with different software. Uh, but we just sort of have to deal with it. So those are the normal and the logistic distributions, which are two of the most important uh, continuous distributions for a random variable that is defined on a sample space of the entire real line. Moving on, uh, we can talk about the uh, Amoroso distribution. That is a random variable that has the uh, PDF uh, written above. Uh, which uh, looks a little bit uh, complicated. And it, or it's not complicated, but it has more terms than in the uh, normal or the logistic distribution case. The Amoroso distribution is defined on a sample space uh, 
where uh, either x is greater than or equal to gamma if theta is greater than zero, or a sample space where x is less than or equal to gamma if theta is less than zero. So basically that's the restriction that these x minus gamma all divided by theta terms have to be uh, positive because they're being uh, raised to power of real numbers. Anyway, uh, an x that has uh, this PDF uh, is said to have a Amoroso distribution. And there's a nice paper uh, whose link is here that goes through uh, essentially all the special cases of the Amoroso distribution of which there's like uh, more than 50 or something like that. And so this is an example of how I like to learn and how I like to teach, which is uh, to start with something uh, extremely general and then uh, to just see a whole lot of uh, special cases of that function. Uh, and then there's sort of less to remember. So the, the PDF of the Amoroso distribution involves this uh, gamma of alpha function. And the gamma function is defined as an integral of zero to infinity of x raised to the power alpha minus one times e raised to the power of negative x integrated uh, over positive values of x. And that function is defined for any real alpha uh, that is greater than zero, it's going to result in a, uh, a positive area. And this is what's known as the gamma function. You'll see it uh, pop up a lot in statistics. It can be seen as a generalization of the factorial function in the following sense, that if alpha is a positive integer, then it's the case that alpha minus one factorial is equal to the gamma function evaluated at alpha. And that uh, helps us understand something that uh, probably seems a little bit curious if you were just thinking about the factorial function. Why is zero factorial defined as one? Well, if you put uh, uh, one, uh, so uh, thinking about the factorial of zero, that's equivalent to the gamma function evaluated at one. And if you plug one into the gamma function, you get x raised to the power of zero, which is just one. And the area under the uh, curve e to the negative x uh, for positive values of x is just one. And so that helps us understand why zero factorial is evaluated at one, uh, is equal to one, but we can use uh, the gamma function for any real uh, positive value of alpha. And um, so that's the Amoroso distribution. Uh, but in most social science applications, uh, if we're going to put a bound on something uh, a, on a random variable, the bound is going to be at zero. Um, and that is going to imply the, the sample space is all real numbers if theta is, is zero. So it doesn't have to be that way. But we just don't have that many things in social science that can take on negative values or uh, random variables that are bounded from below but are bounded uh, at some number other than zero. So if that were the case, you could use the general uh, Amoroso distribution. But what is used most often in the social science is a special case of the Amoroso distribution where gamma is zero, and theta is positive. And if you simplify the PDF for the Amoroso, uh, you get a PDF for what's known as a generalized gamma distribution. Uh, since its uh, sample space is the non-negative real numbers, this distribution is often used for um, uh, duration times. So the amount of time that passes until something messed up happens, like a war breaks out or uh, government collapses, something like that. Um, so uh, those are uh, uh, some of the ways in which the generalized gamma distribution is used in the social sciences, um, more so than the even more general uh, Amoroso distribution. So generalized gamma is a special case of the Amoroso uh, distribution. And the gamma distribution, which you're more likely to have heard of, is a special case of the generalized gamma distribution where beta is equal to one. So the probability density function simplifies uh, further to the little f uh, given 
here. Uh, the mean and the variance of a gamma distribution uh, is equal, the mean uh, is equal to alpha times theta, and the variance is equal to alpha times theta squared, or in other words, equal to the mean times theta. So the gamma distribution has a, uh, the property that as the mean increases, the variance also increases because theta has to be a number that is <coughs> greater than zero. And in turn, the gamma distribution has uh, some special cases, including but not limited to the situation where alpha is one, in which case uh, we have a PDF that characterizes the exponential distribution. And uh, another situation where theta is set to two and alpha is set to nu over two uh, results in a PDF that characterizes the chi-squared distribution with new uh, degrees of freedom. That's another special case of the gamma distribution. And so you've probably heard about some of these distributions in your uh, previous courses, and they may have been hard to uh, remember and uh, which one do you need to use. The point that I'm uh, trying to make is, at least to start out with, uh, you want to use the uh, distribution that is the most general, but also appropriate for the sample space of the variable that you're considering, uh, which may very well be the generalized gamma distribution, uh, which includes uh, a whole bunch of special cases in terms of the gamma distribution or some special case of the, the gamma distribution. And so if you knew the generalized gamma, then it wouldn't be so important to uh, necessarily remember the details about all its uh, special cases because you could just use uh, the general form given here. In fact, you will see in uh, frequent statistics not using the generalized gamma distribution so much, uh, use, use, using the gamma distribution sometimes, but even more likely to use uh, one of its special cases such as exponential, chi-squared, etc. And this is a sort of uh, situation in which uh, frequentist shows its, uh, or frequentism shows its true colors, and uh, its true colors are pretty hideous. Basically, what uh, the reason why uh, frequentist statistics are more likely to use these one-parameter distributions or the two-parameter uh, distributions, such as the, the gamma distribution, is because that's about the limit uh, that frequentist estimators will work well with moderate samples. Uh, such as uh, maximum likelihood that we talked about on the first day. If you have a distribution that has three parameters, particularly if you've got a lot of exponents uh, going on in the PDF, the shape of the PDF can change uh, drastically depending on what the value of, of beta is, et cetera. And thus estimating the parameters of a generalized gamma distribution by maximum likelihood requires really large samples uh, in order to estimate those parameters with any precision. And, uh, you know, a lot of other things can go wrong in the maximization process. There may be saddle points, uh, et cetera. You could end up with at a local maximum rather than a global maximum. And so these three and four parameter distributions are very difficult for uh, frequentist uh, estimation techniques to deal with. And so they make uh, simplifying assumptions such as uh, beta is equal to one, uh, you know, alpha is equal to one, uh, to get a uh, special case of the generalized gamma that has a form with maybe one or two parameters and is a lot easier uh, for them to estimate. But there's no, I can't imagine uh, an argument as to why they're certain that, you know, beta is equal to one or alpha is equal to one. It's just that's what they need to assume in order to obtain an estimator that has good properties uh, with moderate samples. And as we talked about on the first day, because uh, the Bayesian approach doesn't do uh, maximization, uh, it's able to, to deal with these more general functions uh, in ways that work better for finite samples, particularly if you can put some prior information about the parameters uh, into the process, it's possible to do pretty well with these more general, more flexible uh, distributions. 
if uh, Bayesians would just use them uh, rather than relying so heavily on the uh, special cases of these distributions that are more familiar uh, to frequentists. So uh, the final thing uh, that we want to talk about today is an idea of marginalizing over a continuous parameter. So we did this in the uh, discrete case when we were talking about bowling. We came up with a bivariate probability distribution for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll and then the second roll by taking a marginal probability distribution for the number of pins knocked down on the first roll and multiplying by a conditional probability distribution of the number of pins knocked down on the second roll, given the number of pins that were knocked down on the first roll, the product of those two things gave us a bivariate probability distribution. And if we then constructed an 11 by 11 ray, array of all the, the possible things that could happen in a frame of bowling and summed over the columns we got the marginal distribution of the number of pins knocked down on the second roll, uh, irrespective of the number of pins knocked down on the first roll. So that was our marginal probability distribution for the second random variable. So we can do something pretty similar in the case of a, uh, in this case, one discrete random variable and one continuous random variable. So suppose we have some count variable y that we believe follows a Poisson distribution with uh, a parameter lambda. And our beliefs about lambda are governed by a gamma distribution. And this is something that makes uh, frequentist heads explode uh, because they're not willing uh, to, to take uh, or to introduce beliefs into uh, probability. They insist that uh, lambda is some unknown constant, and we just have to uh, deal with that. Whereas uh, Bayesians would say, okay, well, um, you know, I'm going to make decisions based on my beliefs about these unknowns, and my beliefs before seeing the data are that lambda has a gamma distribution. And so for the Bayesian case, you can characterize our beliefs about lambda and the count variable y jointly by taking a marginal probability distribution of lambda, which we said uh, in this case we're going to assume is a gamma distribution that has parameters theta and alpha, and multiplying that by a conditional Poisson distribution for the count uh, given lambda. If we multiply those two things together, we get a bivariate probability distribution for the two random variables, lambda and y. And so we've done this uh, with different colors to see what parts of this uh, correspond to the uh, gamma distribution in red and the blue parts correspond to the uh, Poisson distribution. Uh, and then there's a purple part uh, which results from uh, simplifying uh, the, the pieces involving uh, lambda from the, the two distributions, uh, the red and the blue, to, if we simplify that, we get the expression in the numerator in purple here. And so then we might ask ourselves the question, well, if this is our uh, system of bivariate beliefs about the two unknowns, lambda and y, what are our beliefs about y marginally? Or what are our beliefs about y irrespective of lambda? And in this particular uh, graph, I've shown uh, the joint probability distribution function of lambda and y if uh, theta is 1 and alpha is 2. But those parameters uh, values are not particularly special. If I chose uh, different ones provided that they're both positive, the curves here uh, would have uh, different shapes, but they would have uh, the same basic interpretation. And so we know for a uh, bivariate probability distribution, uh, the total amount of area uh, has to be equal to one. And because this is a bivariate distribution for one continuous parameter lambda, um, which is represented on the horizontal axis here, and a discrete parameter, uh, or discrete unknown y, uh, can be represented with uh, different colored curves uh, 
uh, for the the possible values of y. Now, in principle, there's an infinite number of uh, values of y because there's no upper bound on account. But for these parameter uh, values, most of the probability is uh, concentrated on pretty low numbers of the count, let's say between uh, zero and seven. And so if what we have here on the vertical axis is the joint probability of both uh, lambda and y, which is to say, or not joint probability, joint probability density function. So again, this is a slope rather than a probability. So you could take any value of lambda that you want, let's say two, and you could take any value of y that you want, let's say two also, and you would go up to uh, whatever uh, value that is on the green curve and then over to the vertical axis, it'd be something like 0.075. Uh, and so that would be the value of the joint density function. And you could do that for any positive value of lambda that you wanted and uh, any value of y that you wanted to evaluate the joint probability density function at. And so those are at least eight values of y are given here in uh, different colors. Um, so you can combine them with a the value of lambda and evaluate the joint probability density function. If you want the uh, marginal probability of y, that would entail uh, figuring out what is the area under a curve of a particular color. So when we did the bowling example, we did summation uh, over all the things that could happen in the first roll that would yield a particular number of pins uh, uh, knocked down on the second roll. We summed over all those to get you know the probability of knocking down three pins on your second roll or something like that. In this case, the probability that y is equal to one, for example, is the amount of area under the red curve. And the amount of uh, area under the green curve is equal to the probability that y is equal to two uh, over all possible values that lambda uh, could be. And in principle, uh, lambda could be any positive number, but for these values of theta and alpha, uh, the probability of it being greater than, let's say, six is uh, pretty negligible. So uh, each of these colors, the amount of area under that curve corresponds to the probability uh, that y, uh, that the count variable will be equal to that value of y. And uh, this can be actually calculated. The amount of area under the black curve is 0.25. The amount of area under the red curve also 0.25. Amount of area under uh, the green curve is 0.188, at least rounded to uh, three uh, decimal places. And if you add all these up, uh, they get very close to one, which has to be the case because any uh, probability mass function has to sum to one over the uh, entire sample space for y. Uh, it doesn't get exactly the one because there's a small chance that y could be greater than seven and I couldn't fit uh, all those uh, numbers on here because you know y in principle uh, could be any positive integer. But basically uh, most of the mass is concentrated on the integers zero uh, through seven. And thus we can evaluate the probability of uh, y uh, taking that value marginally or irrespective of lambda uh, by figuring out what is the area under uh, each of these curves. So uh, how did we figure out uh, what number to use for uh, that marginal probability? Um, <clears throat> that can be uh, figured out analytically in this particular uh, case. And so in order to get the marginal probability distribution for y, we are going to integrate the joint probability distribution for lambda and y over all admissible values of lambda, uh, which is uh, the positive half of the real line. In order to make this a bit easier, we're going to make the substitution uh, 
P is equal to theta divided by theta plus one. So that is going to be some number between uh, zero and one. And we're going to think about P and alpha as being the parameters of this marginal distribution for Y. So if we take uh, what we had before on the previous slide, this, and you know, make the substitution uh, for uh, P and then take and move outside all these uh, terms over here on the denominator that do not depend on lambda. Uh, we get some one over something uh, divide, uh, times uh, this integral from zero to infinity of uh, what can be recognized as the kernel function for a uh, gamma distribution with uh, parameters alpha plus y and p. So if you go back to uh, the gamma distribution, you can see that the kernel of uh, this gamma distribution appears under the uh, integral here as we integrate over lambda. And since that's the kernel of the uh, gamma distribution and the gamma distribution integrates to one, we know that the normalizing constant or the uh, what this integral evaluates to is going to be the normalizing constant for a gamma distribution with parameters alpha plus y and p. And so that in the numerator is going to be this purple thing here, the gamma function evaluated at alpha plus y multiplied by uh, p raised to the power uh, alpha plus y. And if we just uh, simplify that a little bit more, make the substitution that y factorial is equal to uh, gamma, uh, is equal to the gamma function evaluated at y plus one, which is sort of the fundamental property of the, the gamma function. We get this form of uh, the, the uh, probability mass function for y, a ratio of these three uh, gamma functions, and then something that looks uh, kind of like uh, a binomial kernel p raised to the power of y times one minus p raised to the power of alpha. And if alpha is uh, an integer, a positive integer, then this could actually be simplified even more uh, to a choose function uh, multiplied by uh, this kernel involving p, or uh, the kernel inv involving y um, in any event, this p to the y times one minus p uh, to the alpha. In any event, this marginal uh, probability distribution for y has a name. It is a negative binomial distribution. The expectation of this negative binomial distribution is uh, given by, if you work out the uh, expectations, alpha times 1 minus p divided by p, and the variance is equal to alpha times 1 minus p divided by p squared, which simplifies to mu over p. And since p is a number between 0 and 1, the variance of a negative binomial distribution is greater than its mean. And so the negative binomial distribution is a more flexible distribution for uh, modeling count variables because it has uh, more variance than does a Poisson distribution, which only has one parameter and has the property that the mean and the variance are the same. And as we said last week, that's often inappropriate for social science uh, data where we empirically observe when we do observe counts, uh, they usually have some you know, big outliers uh, or very positive outliers that uh, result in a uh, empirical distribution that has a variance that exceeds the mean and thus, we said uh, a Poisson distribution wouldn't be particularly appropriate in that case. But a negative binomial distribution may be appropriate in that case uh, because uh, it has two parameters, additional flexibility, and that makes it capable of being an appropriate distribution for empirical phenomena that have uh, over dispersion or variance in excess uh, of the mean. And so this process of uh, taking a Poisson distribution for uh, the count variable y and uh, multiplying it by a gamma distribution uh, for 
lambda and then marginalizing out or integrating out the lambda uh, variable to yield a marginal probability distribution for the count, which just depends on p, or you could write it in terms of theta if you want, and alpha is what is known as a compound distribution or uh, mixing a Poisson distribution with a gamma distribution. And you might say, well, I want something uh, even more flexible than uh, just a two-parameter distribution. So you could go back and mix a Poisson distribution for lambda with a generalized gamma distribution, uh, a Poisson distribution for y with a generalized gamma distribution for lambda. But then if you tried to integrate out lambda to give you a marginal probability distribution for y, uh, I believe you would find that that integral is uh, impossible to do. And so that's one of the, the reasons why, uh, you know, frequentists uh, is sort of hit a stumbling block there, whereas uh, the Bayesian approach would actually allow uh, us to uh, deal with a situation uh, like that using uh, random numbers in place of uh, impossible integrals in order to do Monte Carlo integration rather than uh, pencil and paper integration. So that's something that uh, we'll learn how to do as uh, the weeks go on. And this process of uh, basically multiplying distributions together, marginalizing them out, is known as a mixing of one distribution with the other, which is if you take a distribution uh, and mix it with one of these babies, which I totally own, you get a distribution that has uh, more variance, and that makes sense uh, since you're uh, taking the parameters of the distribution to be uh, random variables rather than merely constants. So that's it for today.